Welcome to the Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Thanks for downloading this edition of the Why Factor, a program that seeks to find out why we do the things we do. I hope you enjoy it. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. BBC World Service. I'm Mike Williams with the Y Factor. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe deeply. Remain calm. Because today we're going to examine road rage. Hey, come on, man. What are you going to do? I've got it all on camera. You never signaled that you almost took me off. People getting a little crazy. What? What? I'm cycling. In their cars and on their bikes. Pull over! Come on! Right now! You and me! No! You're gonna pull over! Come on! Out of the car! Move your car over! Why do we get it? Why do we get this rage, particularly behind the wheel of a car? And how might we deal with it? Calming exercises. Car yoga. I've got a little, uh, a little problem with transport and travel. It's not about public transport, it's about driving. The comedian Rod Gilbert on what gives him road rage. There isn't room for your car inside mine. I'm driving a flipping Toyota Yaris, not a yellow ruddy TARDIS. <laughs> when I look in my rearview mirror, I should see me, not you. I'm still traumatised by your horrible, gnarled, twisted, stupid face. I could see what you had for breakfast in that mirror. <laughs> I've been in relationships that were less intimate than this. <laughs> I know married couples that aren't as close as we are right now. Elton John and his first wife never went this far. We're in this protective bubble and we're unable to see any sort of body language or other types of cues to understand the intentions of the other person. So when somebody cuts us off, we're much more likely to assume that they did it to us on purpose to try and annoy us. Dr Mark Solman is a senior lecturer at Cranfield University in the UK and he's based at the Driver Research Group there. And also it's quite difficult to, for the other driver to apologise or whatever. So, for example, if you're on the pavement and somebody bumps into you, you can see their body language, you can hear what they're saying, so you understand, OK, they didn't actually mean to do it. Whereas in a car, that's not possible or not so easy to demonstrate. And secondly, uh, as we're isolated from social cues, we also um, feel more free to express our emotions. So when you're in a car, you're much more likely to yell and scream than you would be, if you say, walking on the footpath. So two swamis uh, had come to the United States, to Boston, and my fiancé and I were invited to drive them. Glenn Scherer has been teaching yoga for seven years, and he's the creator of car yoga. If you know Boston, Boston was a series of cow paths. It, they just twisted and turned, and so the streets are crazy. Finding your way anywhere. And... Karen hadn't driven there in a while, and so she's trying to get these uh, swamis to an appointment at Harvard. Behind us, in the back seat, two very peaceful men in orange robes. I'm in the front, I'm navigating with my iPhone, and we're in our, in our Prius trying to get to where we're trying to go, which was a, a little tiny side street, and everything's one way in the wrong direction. And I'm telling her right, and she's saying left, and she's my fiancé, and I'm, you know, you know, can kind of imagine where things are going, and we're starting to heat up. I think simultaneously we both looked in the rearview mirror, and we looked back, and 
It was like looking at one of those Buddhas, in carved Buddhas in the museum, and they were both seated, and they were just in this blissful state, smiling and looking toward the front of the car, and we both, it, it was like instantaneous that we both just went, oh, okay. And we got very calm, and we straightened out our directions, and there was no heat. But there was uh, sudden cooperation. It was as if it wasn't two people in front anymore having a fight. It was two people who had become one in union trying to do accomplish their task. Next thing we knew, we were where we needed to go. Now, I'm just filling out a survey here about driver anger. It's been put together by Dr. Mark Sulman. Driving anger. How much do the following situations make you feel angry? I can choose not at all, a little, some, much, and very much. Someone in front of you doesn't move off straight away when the light turns green. Oh, a little. Someone's driving too fast for the road conditions. Uh, yeah, much. That makes me angry. A pedestrian walks slowly across the middle of the street, slowing you down. Uh, yeah, much. Someone driving too slowly in the outside lane and holding up traffic, very much. Someone is driving very close to your rear bumper, now, very, very much. Very much just doesn't cover it. I, I, very, very, very much. It drives me crazy. Someone weaving it in and out. The that? stereotype of a road rage sufferer is an angry man shaking his fist and honking his horn. A man. But what about women? Interestingly, women report higher levels of anger on the road, but men are much more likely to express their anger in an aggressive manner. So the public perception that people are, that men are more likely to experience road rage is actually relatively true, but it's actually women that actually feel more angry than men. So women are more likely to deal with their anger in an adaptive and constructive way. So they're much more likely to simply concentrate on driving safely themselves or just to realise that everyone makes mistakes and carry on with their journey. Road rage is a loss of control to a situation that you experience in a car. Natalie McGlone is a professional racing driver in the Porsche Club Championship. Those fight or flight emotions that come out and it's a constant battle between that adrenaline that you're feeling that you react to something, you know, someone's, someone's pulled out in front of you, it's sparked off that adrenaline rush and it's, you know, a chemical reaction in your brain that then takes place. I think for me as a, a racing driver, I, I do have to keep that in check. The fight or flight is something that I feel on the start line uh, every single race. But as soon as those lights go out, it's the, the fighter emotion that, that is kept and the flight goes away. That adrenaline has to be kept at a level that is controllable so that your decisions are the right ones. And I think that if people could try and practice that, the car yoga sounds like a fantastic idea because I think the more people are able to control their emotions by practicing doing that in the situations that make their their adrenaline spike the better they are at reacting to them and the less and less the road rage will occur okay so you've you've gotten in the car you've buckled up you're pulling out of the drive or actually before you even pull out of the driveway just start to deepen your breath. You want to double the length of your exhale, so you're going to be relaxed when you're driving. So we're going to start, and it's inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, 
six, you're out in traffic and suddenly you've just been cut off by a bus and you've jumped to that bloody SOB, whatever you're thinking, suddenly you jump into your breath work. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you continue. And instead of staying in the fight or flight response the rage the anger the upset that also saves your life because the sympathetic nervous system jumped in you responded to the tiger to the bus cutting you off you spun the wheel you put on the brakes you did everything you needed to do but you don't want to stay stressed that's what hypertension is you don't come down from the stress so what you're doing by doubling the length of your exhale is you're preventing that cascading stress response that can happen when cortisol, a stress hormone, is pumping through your body and increasing the fight or flight response to the point that now you're chasing the bus down the highway and you're risking everybody on that bus's life and your life and the drivers around your life. It differs throughout the world. There are obviously cultural differences with regards to the expression of emotions and also differences in the traffic environment, which um, are more likely to lead to people experiencing driving anger or expressing driving anger. There are certainly cultural differences with regards to how okay it is in a certain culture to express emotions. So for example, stereotypically, we would expect people from Southern European countries to be more free in their expression of their emotions compared to say for example people from the UK or New Zealand who are generally thought of as being a bit more reserved. My car stopped at a red light and I got rear-ended. Monica Chada worked for the BBC in India for many years and had the great pleasure of driving on Delhi's infamous roads. And so I got out of my car to see what was going on, and I saw that the car that had rear-ended me, the front fender had come off. And so I kind of looked at the driver to see, hey, I, was, I, I had stopped at a red light. <laughs> what went wrong here? And he just looked up and spoke to me very angrily, saying, what are you looking at? Your car is fine. It's my car that's damaged. And yes, my car was fine, even though I was rear-ended. So I very meekly looked at him and said, yes, you're right sorry about that and I sat in my car and drove off when the light turned green but that's not the first time it's happened road rage is quite the thing in Delhi and anyone will tell you that people will never agree that they're wrong just uh, like the driver who rear-ended me and then looked at me as if it was my fault that his front fender had come off and also if you're taking too long in traffic people are known to just shout at you very angrily the two years that I lived in Delhi, we came up with various reasons for it, ranging from, well, maybe it's the power capital, so everyone is on a power trip. One of the first things you would always hear if, if someone hit you or if someone would try to get their right of way, they'd be like, do you know who I am? Do you know whose um, son or daughter I am? And, um, and so that was one of the reasons that we thought uh, was why road rage was so huge. And Delhiites aren't exactly known for their patience, at least on the road. Section three of this survey, how do you react when feeling angry during driving? So the choices are almost never, sometimes often, and almost always. I call the other drivers' names aloud, <laughs> almost always. I make negative comments about the other driver aloud, almost always. I make negative comments about the other driver under my breath, well, almost never, because I normally always say it out loud. I try to get out the car and tell the other driver off, never, no, almost never. I swear at the other driver aloud, almost always. I give the other driver the finger, almost always. I make hostile gestures other than giving the finger, almost always. I shake my fist at the other driver, I've already done it with the fingers. So I think the Younger people are much more likely to experience higher levels of anger and are much more likely also to express their anger in an aggressive manner. There's a, a reasonably clear uh, reduction in anger by age. So the older people experience less anger than the younger people in general. One of my friends says the reason for that is because the 
people who are older are the ones causing the anger amongst the younger people. <laughs> you have two systems, and they need to both be functioning. Sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight response. That's the tiger, and you either are going to run or you're going to hit the thing with a rock. Parasympathetic nervous system, you're home. You want to be able to digest your dinner. If you're in fight or flight, and again, this is hypertension. This is what happens when we can't get out of fight or flight and we're always under a state of kind of perpetual low-level stress. That blood that's out in your extremities is not coming into your organs, into your belly, into your digestive system. You want to be able to rest and digest. And what's happening is that blood is now flowing towards your core. It's flowing to your digestive organs to help the flow of um, nutrients and waste. And your heartbeat slows, your blood pressure goes down, your thoughts are calmer. If you practice just the slow breathing technique, it, almost anybody I've ever had in a yoga class notices the difference immediately. And I'm doing the speed limit, so back off. Flashing your lights, beeping your horn, suggesting things about my private life with your hands. You're like Marcel Marceau with mime Tourette's. <laughs> You should have a uniform and special markings on your vehicle so we know who you are. So maybe you can all get out of your way. Maybe a siren and a flashing light. People would point in wonder and say, is it a doctor? Is it a policeman? No, it's gesticulating, egotistical, self-important. My total disregard for other people probably masks my own self-loathing man. <laughs> And the ultimate irony was when you forced me to swerve out of your destructive path, you had a baby on board sticker on the back. <laughs> you want to know how you're driving? I'll tell you, you're driving like a monkey who's going through a painful divorce and his hands glued to the steering wheel and his foot stapled to the accelerator. That's how you're driving. <laughs> but maybe I should thank you. Maybe I should give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you're trying to be helpful. Maybe all that sign language is you trying to tell me to switch my engine off, stick it in neutral and let you push me home. Is that it? <laughs> It's a very valuable tool to have and very useful tool and a lot of the tools of yoga fit into daily life in a beautiful way and a, and a functional way. And I don't want to pretend that I'm some Swami who is perfect at this and can do this all the time. I'm just like everybody else out there and some days it just works beautifully for me and I think I've saved my life a few times and a few other lives doing it. One, two, three. One, two, three. Two, three, four, five, six. Thanks for listening to The Y Factor. If you'd like to hear more episodes, do visit the website bbcworldservice.com slash Y Factor.